Thank you, Phil. Thank you, everybody. Again, we appreciate each and every one of you for traveling here since many of you traveled from out of state. We greatly appreciate you dealing with planes, trains, and automobiles to get here and to spend some time with us on a Friday. And uh, I do want to say thank you to these fine folks, all this crowd sitting over here, and Karen for all the work that she's done for this conference. Uh, so let's give them another round of applause. I stand on the shoulders of giants, and that's that crowd over there. Like, these folks do all the work so that I can do what I do, right? I couldn't do it without them. And I literally mean the shoulders of giants. So Chris and Matt, these guys are like six foot five. They're giants. And I was telling somebody just a few minutes ago, it's so funny because the, many of these folks work remote, you know, and especially over the past couple of years, we've had to hire folks remotely, over WebEx, never meeting in person until just the other night, right? So you can imagine having met a person over WebEx, you kind of envision kind of what you think they look like, and then they show up in person, you're like, that's Chris's face, but it's on the six foot five frame, and I wasn't expecting that. It's kind of weird. Anyway, so I, uh, I love my SOS family. Thank you to each and every one of you. All right. Have you had fun today? Y'all didn't hear me. Have you had fun today? That's a little bit better. Let's try again. Have you had fun today? All right, so it's audience participation time. Who is your favorite comedian? Phil Planamira. Yep. I heard Bill Murray, but that's incorrect. It's the great Bill Murray. Thank you very much. Remember that. Who else? Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld. Love me some Seinfeld. I'm with you, man. Uh, any others? Robin Williams. Wow. Too soon? Great community. Yeah, Rodney. That's a good one. How about Jimmy Fallon? Right? I like Jimmy Fallon. Any Jimmy Fallon fans here? Yeah? So... How about your favorite Tonight Show bit, right? He's doing a great, great job as the host of the Tonight Show. Do you have any favorite bits on the Tonight Show? Wow, I stumped the crowd. No Tonight Show fans? Wow. How about thank you notes? Anybody seen thank you notes? He does this great thing called thank you notes. So the way it works is, he says, you know, I... I was kind of busy this week. I didn't have time to write out my thank you notes. So if you don't mind as the audience, I'll write out my thank you notes now. And so he looks at James. He says, James, can I have some thank you note music? And James plays some uh, overly dramatic music, you know, to get him in the mood for writing thank you notes. And then James usually giggles, right, because they're just silly like that. Uh, and then Jimmy writes out his thank you notes. Well... Kind of goes like that, you know, thank you, caps lock, for being the Gilbert Gottfried of the keyboard, right? That's a Jimmy Fallon thank you note. All right, so I kind of feel like that's been this week, like I've been kind of busy, like all the preparations that went into today, like I haven't had a whole lot of time to do the things that I need to do. So one of those things is the daily quick malware analysis blog post. Have you seen these things? We've been putting them out for the last few weeks. I wasn't asking for applause, but I'll take it. I'll take it. No. So this is a fun thing that we started doing a few weeks ago. If you haven't seen it, where we go out and we take like a PCAP sample and run that into Security Onion and then take a few screenshots of some alerts, some Zeke logs, some interesting sessions from the full packet capture, and just put that out there on the blog and on social media so that folks kind of see what modern day attacks actually look like. Some of the things that you might want to be looking for in your environment. So we've been doing that every single day and have had a, a really great response to it. Like folks really seem to dig it a good bit. Well, I did it, I think, on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, but like yesterday, I just didn't even have the time. So, with apologies to Jimmy Fallon, 
I haven't had time to do it, so I thought if you don't mind, we do a little quick malware analysis. Is that okay with you? So, you know, it's at this point that I would ask James, you know, for some quick malware analysis music. James is not impressed with my shenanigans. You know, he, he normally giggles with Jimmy, but he's not giggling for me, so I guess I don't get any quick malware analysis music. Womp womp. So let's do some quick malware analysis. All right. So we've got the latest version of Security Onion here. So what I've done is I've taken a PCAP and I've imported it into Security Onion using a tool that we have called SO Import PCAP. And if you haven't used this, it's really a great way to get your feet wet with Security Onion. Reason being is that you can do this in a minimal virtual machine, only one network interface, only four gigabytes of RAM. You don't have to have a big whopping machine. Um, and you can do this really quickly and easily. It's a great way to get some experience, not only with Security Onion, but with malware analysis and threat hunting and all that great fun stuff that we do. So I've taken this PCAP, I've imported it. So at this point, the, the PCAP, the traffic in that PCAP was run through Suricata to generate alerts. It was run through Zeek to generate logs. And it was stored where we could then pull the full packet capture if we want to pivot to that kind of stuff. So here we go. Let's take a, a look at alerts. So looking here at our alerts page, we do have one alert. What do you know? This is in the Emerging Threats rule set. It's in the policy category, and it's for a curl user agent outbound. Now, this could be totally legitimate traffic. You might have you know, plenty of legitimate uses of curl in your environment, but in other environments that are more locked down, you might have no legitimate uses for curl, and so this might be interesting. So let's drill into this particular alert. And, you know, we could go and kind of open this alert up, and we could take a look at some of the data within the alert itself. But, you know, me, I'm kind of a full packet capture kind of a guy. I like to see the packets, so let's click on here, and let's go down to Actions. And then go to PCAP. All right, so here's what we see. Up at the very top, we see an HTTP GET request for a file called file.dat. It's coming from a web server at 192.168.1.83. And there we see on the third line the user agent string of curl version 755.1. And that user agent string is why the alert fired in the first place. We could take a look at the rule that generated that alert and we could confirm all of that stuff. But here we do, in fact, see that this is a true positive, that the alert fired on traffic coming from a user agent of curl. Okay, that's cool. But the plot thickens, because then we see the web server's response, HTTP 200 OK. We see an interesting server name. This is simple HTTP. That's not like a normal web server you would see out on the internet, like Apache or IIS or some other uh, kind of production web server. And then we see content type application octet stream. So this file was called file.dat, which doesn't really tell us a whole lot, right? Dat could mean a few different things, and application octet stream doesn't really tell us, you know, it's, we don't know if it's a Word document or an EXE or, or PDF or whatever the case might be. So then we have this stuff down here. What does this appear to be? Ah, okay, we see a whole bunch of zeros and ones. So, what we could do is, this resolution is getting to me, we could take this PCAP and use one of our recent upgrades, which is being able to pivot directly from this PCAP over to CyberChef. Any CyberChef fans here? Love me some CyberChef, right? It's this great tool that allows you to do all kinds of decoding and analysis type stuff. So we click this one button, and it's going to take our session. It's going to send it over to CyberChef in hexdump format. 
and it's going to automatically tell CyberChef to apply the from hex dump recipe. You see that in the middle column there. And then in the output pane, you get to see that session in a more readable format than the hex dump that's up here. All right, very cool. So we're kind of back to where we were before at this, at this output box, but we have all the power of CyberChef at our disposal. So now that we have all that power, how might we go about kind of digging in to those zeros and ones that were at the bottom of this PCAP? I thought we had some CyberChef fans. All right, well, how about this? How about we start with, like, a habit that I'm in is if I'm looking at HTTP traffic, the first thing I might want to do is kind of strip those headers off, right? So I could go up here and search for strip HTTP headers, and if I just double click that, that brings the recipe over here and it applies it to the output. And so now we see that that first set of HTTP headers that had the HTTP GET request, that's been stripped off. Now we're left with the HTTP headers from the web server. So we could manually apply strip HTTP headers again, but if you'll notice, CyberChef has this nice little magic wand here. And if I hover over the magic wand, it tells me that if you apply strip HTTP headers, it will produce this other output. So it's like CyberChef read my mind or something, right? So I click the magic wand. It applies the strip HTTP headers. Now we're down to just the raw zeros and ones, which is really where we want to be. All right, so at this point, what do we want to do? So if we apply the from binary recipe, all right, it's going to kind of peel back one layer of this little puzzle that we have in front of us. What are we left with now in the output pane? I think I heard something from over here. All right, I heard hex. So what if we apply from hex? Aha, the plot thickens. We've peeled back one more layer. Notice we have another magic wand here. So this magic wand, when I hover over it, it says you can apply from base64. So it's identified that what's in that output pane is base64 encoded. OK, cool. And then after applying the from base64 recipe, it will then automatically render what it's seeing as an image. Interesting. Should we click the magic wand? Yes, we should. Yes, yes. All right. Unfortunately, the resolution kind of, kind of messes with us here. How can I resize this to get it where I want it to be? Oh. Where is he? Where's Paul? There he is. That's for you, buddy. Yo, dog, we heard you like encoding. Yep. All right. So, that's kind of cool and all, right? So, now you can very easily take and go from an alert to PCAP to CyberChef. You can use CyberChef to peel back the layers, and you can find exhibit in your network traffic. Right? That's a fun time. But wait, there's more. So if I go back to alerts, and I go back to my alert, and I click and get my action menu, and go down to actions. Before we clicked PCAP, we have this other great option that we added called correlate. This is one of my favorite things to do, because what correlate does is it uses community ID to say, OK, for this particular piece of traffic, with this source IP, this source port, destination IP, destination port, we create essentially a hash that uniquely identifies that connection. Now, let's look for that hash in any other log that we might have anywhere. 
from Suricata, from Zeek, from other data types as well. So if you look at this output, you'll see that I have a Suricata alert. That's what we started with, okay? Above that, we have two Zeek logs. So we have the connection log and the HTTP log. We've already looked at the, the full packet capture, so looking at those Zeek logs, it's not really gonna give us any more information than we already had. But what's the fourth log down there? Hey, now that's kinda neat. What if I click on that and then click include just to kind of filter down to that? So now I've got a sysmon log. Now wait a minute. Sysmon, let's back up a minute, right? Because Zeek and Suricata both can natively generate community ID, but does Sysmon do that? No, Sysmon doesn't. How did we get that? Well. When that log comes in, we tell Elasticsearch to automatically, dynamically generate that community ID value on the fly. So that means then that we can correlate from our network data to our host data and vice versa. Very cool. So where is all this going? Well, what that means is I can actually see the process on the Windows box that generated that data, right? I can actually go into this Again, my resolution is a little bit suboptimal, but we can see all of the fields here, and if we drill into uh, the particular field, it's gonna show us the actual curl binary that generated that traffic in the first place, right? So I can also do things like, see if I can find it. The resolution is messing with me here. Let's see if I can uh, hunt for this. Here we go. So let's see, we were looking at the Sysmon network connection log and we then took kind of a, a piece of that log and we hunted on that so that we could then find this other Sysmon log for process creation. Right, so you kind of see this journey of being able to tie all of these different logs together, and that's really one thing that we've worked very hard in trying to build this interface that makes it uh, so cohesive to bring all of these logs together and to pivot from one data type to another, both network and host and vice versa. So that's our, our quick little, let me show this if I can, if the, Resolution won't mess with me too bad. So what we can do is we could do something like group by the parent command line. Yeah, this resolution makes it a little bit difficult. And maybe the process command line as well. So those little clicks in the interface Right? Those are what really kind of make you efficient as a threat hunter, being able to drill all the way down into the nitty gritty details and then group by a particular field and then show that data and stacked. This is just a very small example, of course, but if you think about you know, kind of stacking this kind of data across your enterprise, looking at all the processes that were created, looking at parent command line, process command line, that then becomes something very, very powerful, right? All right, so just a very basic example, and, and really it's all about Paul Melson in the end, so thank you, Paul, for inspiring all of us as always. All right. Did you like that little exercise? James still didn't like the exercise. James is hating on me. Oh well, sorry James. So, here's the question. Thinking about that exercise, I said in the beginning that I did so import pcap to import the pcap file, but how did I get the host data? That came from this brand new utility called so import evtx, thank you Josh Brower, that allows you to take an evtx file from a Windows system and import it into Security Onion. So now this 
thing that we've had traditionally of SO import PCAP, it now has this nice twin brother that can do the same thing from the host side. So now you can have an import virtual machine, very minimal resources, and you can very quickly and easily import network data and host data, and you can correlate the two together in one little VM, and you can have that very quickly and easily. So that's pretty cool stuff, but wait, where did SO import EVTX come from? Because it wasn't in version 2.3.70. Well, 2.3.80 drops today. So version 2.3.80 is out this afternoon. It includes SO import EVTX and some other fun stuff too. Do you want to hear about the other fun stuff? Okay, okay, you talked me into it. So how many folks work in security teams of more than one person? All right, so you're going to love this. Role-based access control. Thank you, Jason Ertl. Right, Jason has spent the last couple of months working tirelessly to bring solid, comprehensive, role-based access control to Security Onion. This includes not just Elasticsearch and Kibana, but it's across Security Onion console to include alerts and our hunt interface and PCAP jobs and all of the great stuff that you do in Security Onion. It's now got a standard and consistent model for role-based access control. So you can define your super users, you can define your analysts, you can fine tune down to all of those privileges that you see in that chart there. So Jason's done a tremendous job with this, so again, thank you, Jason, for all the hard work that went into it. You can read about this, it's already in our documentation, you just go to the RBAC page, and it includes this chart and a whole bunch of information about how you can access uh, role-based access control. All right, what else? Well, if you're in a security team, chances are you have a distributed deployment, meaning you have a manager, you have multiple search nodes, you have multiple forward nodes. So when you build your search nodes traditionally, you would have each of those search nodes as independent elastic clusters. They would be managed by the manager, and the manager would query all of them via cross-cluster search. Something that we've had many requests for is to do an actual elastic cluster where those search nodes join to form one cluster. They act as one cohesive unit. We've actually had this support in place for a couple of releases, although we haven't really publicized it that much because it was still kind of taking shape. Uh, but we're now ready to officially announce it. So as you're running setup on a new installation, you choose the advanced option, because this is for advanced users with advanced use cases, and you can choose that elastic clustering. You can build search nodes that join into one cluster. Again, all of this has been documented. It's already in the documentation today, so if you just go to our Elasticsearch page, all of that information is out there. Right back at you, buddy. All right, so as I mentioned, it's been in a few releases. We first introduced it in 2321. We've been steadily working on it, but I want to make sure I mention a couple of warnings and disclaimers. We still recommend for most folks that you go with our traditional method of, of cross-cluster search because it's easier, it requires less know-how of elastic internals, it requires less maintenance and configuration. But if you need, if you absolutely need those advanced features in an elastic cluster, things like replicas and hot and warm nodes and things like that, you can absolutely turn this on. Uh, but keep in mind that we do not support in-place migration of your existing cross-cluster search deployment. This is only for new installations that supports elastic clustering. All right, so this is what it looks like when you're performing a new installation, you're running through setup, you're building the manager, you choose the advanced option, it's going to ask if you want a traditional Elasticsearch cluster, and that's specifically for things like replicas and hot warm indices, and you fill out the prompts, 
and it will build a true elastic cluster for you. Pretty cool stuff. Next up, any cloud users here? I think we had a question about cloud before today. So in addition to our Amazon AWS image, which has been out for a while now, uh, we now have an Azure Marketplace image. This is another thing that Jason has been working tirelessly on, so thank you, Jason, for all the blood, sweat, and tears that went into that. So whether you're in Amazon or you're in Azure, we've got an image for both of those. So you can go to securityonion.net slash Azure. It will take you to this page on the Azure Marketplace, and you'll be good to go. We've also got documentation that goes along with that, and you can find that in our standard securityonion.net slash docs site. All right, so all of our documentation has been updated for version 2.3.80. That's available now. And especially for those of you who might be in air-gapped environments or maybe you just want a portable copy of the documentation to carry with you that doesn't require batteries, you can buy the book from Amazon today and that's been updated for 2.3.80 as well. And we're officially over 300 pages in that documentation. Keep in mind that the, uh, what's different from the printed version to the online version is the printed version includes uh, a, a very nice foreword by Sir Richard Baitlick, uh, one of my great heroes and role models of, of all time. So he wrote the foreword. It's also got a discount code for our online training as well. So if you purchase the book, you get a discount code which easily pays for the price of the book. You can find that at securityonion.net slash book. And the proceeds go to Rural Technology Fund. We heard earlier today from Mr. Chris Sanders, and he's one of the founders of RTF. They're doing great work. And so we are, uh, as of today, sending a check to Rural Tech Foundation uh, for all of the proceeds for the book for the previous year. And we're also doing a company donation above and beyond that of six thousand dollars so <laughs> rural technology fund is a great project they're doing great work so we're very happy to support that um, and I highly recommend to each and every one of you if you're looking for a worthy project to support with your funds they do a great job of getting technology into schools that so desperately need it uh, and this is, you know, something that really kind of hits home with me because growing up, I, I grew up on a dirt road. My address was literally Rural Route 2. Uh, and so this is something that appeals to me. This is something that I want to support and uh, would love it if others would support it as well. All right. Next up, lots of folks have asked for certification. You got it. All right, so if you're ready to prove your Security Onion skills to the world, we've got a new Security Onion certified professional certification coming very soon. Bryant Treckle and his team have done a great job in putting together the questions, the answers, and making sure that that certification is ready to roll. So thank you to Bryant and team for that. And for all of you in this room, if you are interested, you can get a code good for 50% off of the test. Uh, if you book it by the end of the month, October 31st. So just send us an email at certification at securityonionsolutions.com. All right, so that's certification. Another announcement. We got a new case studies course, right? This is something we've been talking about for a while, and it's coming really, 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 really soon. All right, we're really excited about it. Uh, Josh Brower and the rest of the folks have done a, a lot of work on that. So look for an announcement in the next few weeks. All right, so we kind of hinted at this earlier in the developer panel uh, in terms of roadmap and what's coming next. So we're dropping 2.3.80 today. Next release will be 2.3.90. What's coming then? Well, support for Ubuntu 20.04. All right, lots of folks have asked for that. So we're going to be releasing that in 2.3.90. Mike Reeves has already done most of the work for that. So thank you, Mike. 
Um, and so when that comes out in 2390, that might come out as fresh installs only, uh, supporting Ubuntu 2004, because the process of doing an in-place upgrade from 18 to 20 might take some additional time. But we are pledging to have at least fresh install support in 2390. All right, what comes after 2390? The road ahead. So we started thinking about what are we going to try to start working on over the next year? Mind you, there's no ETA on this stuff. This is just stuff that we're going to start working on. One of the things we mentioned earlier was case management. So currently today, we're using the Hive for our case management. And I think I mentioned earlier, we had already kind of made a decision to kind of go in a different direction for case management. And then the Hive came out a couple of weeks ago and they announced a licensing change and that just kind of confirmed our decision to change our case management solution. So that's one of the things that we're gonna start working on over the next year. The next thing, and I think Mike may have mentioned this earlier as well, is that we're gonna start the migration from Docker to Podman, right? So we're still gonna be supporting both CentOS and Red Hat type clones, uh, and also Ubuntu, and Podman will do both of those, all right? So, it's going to be really kind of the same container images. It's just going to be the actual binary that runs, that instantiates those images. It's going to change from Docker to Podman. Mike mentioned earlier that in terms of, you know, we had a question about CentOS 8 and the fact that CentOS 8 kind of had this big surprise uh, in terms of going away. So in terms of us moving from CentOS 7 to CentOS 8, that will actually be to Rocky Linux version 8. So Rocky Linux is out now, it's stable, it's reliable. So we're gonna start working on that support for Rocky Linux 8. And then finally, you know, there's a lot of things that we wanna do inside of Security Onion console. There's a lot of web management stuff that we want to enable you to do. So you can do more pointy clicky stuff rather than typey typey stuff. All right, so we're gonna start working on more web management for the grid. All right, questions so far? I'm building anticipation because you all want to know what the one last thing is, don't you? Yes, you do. Hmm, maybe I'll just take a sip of water. So a little bit of backstory. A couple of years ago, you may remember, we announced official Security Onion Solutions appliances. These are standard 1U and 2U rack mount boxes and we partnered with Dell. Dell's been a great partner in providing really great hardware, and we've got some, some nice kind of custom hardware uh, in some of those models. And so this has been really a great partnership that's enabled folks to have a really turnkey operation so that we can drop ship them a box, and it's already got our software installed. It's a whole lot easier, more streamlined process than having to go through their standard procurement cycles, get some box off the shelf, and then go and install our software and hope that all the hardware works as intended and getting it specs just right. So this has been a really great thing uh, and, and lots of our customers have really enjoyed it. But we have had one request over and over and over again. So lots and lots of our uh, men and women in uniform in the military you know, they do this kind of emergency incident response where they have to get on a plane and they have to fly to the other side of the globe and they have to hook up to a network, start monitoring traffic and do some emergency incident response. It's not the easiest thing in the world to take a 1U or 2U box and try to cram it into an overhead compartment. Can we agree on that? It's a little suboptimal, right? So. What we are officially announcing today is 
Security Onion Solutions, Response Ready Appliances. Did I say it right? How about that? Do you want to see them? They want to see them. Are you ready? I don't know if you're ready. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Security Onion Solutions, go now, go fast, and go big, all right? So we start with the go now. This is the little guy, okay? So when you got to go now, you got to go now. Just pick the little guy up, throw it in a backpack, and go, right? So that's the go now. Very small, very portable, uh, very powerful for such a small form factor, right? It's got a Xeon processor, 64 gigs of RAM, two different NIC options, 16 terabytes of NVMe. See, I don't know all these specs off the top of my head. Mike's got our, our hardware on lockdown, man. So that's the go now. Pretty spiffy little box. Next up is the Go Fast. So if you want to really go fast and handle more traffic than the Go Now can handle, you want the Go Fast. All right, so this is essentially like a Dell 6515 with some really nice AMD Epic processors, lots of RAM, lots of storage that's been folded in half into this custom form factor that will fit in an overhead compartment, right? It's pretty slick. So that's the go fast. Then we have the beast, the go big. This is the absolute top of the line box, every conceivable option. Again, folded in half to fit in an overhead compartment, comes in a nice kind of roller bag, right? So easily portable. That's some other pictures of kind of the insides when you kind of crack that case, the beast is just waiting to come out, right? So that's our SOS response ready kits, the go now, the go big, and the go fast. These are available as kits, which includes not only the box itself, but also switches, taps, laptops. We can build all of that for you, right? So for our men and women in uniform, we're there for you. Right? We can build you that kit, we can provide the support for the hardware and the software, and we're going to be right there next to you, helping you with that emergency incident response. So thank you to our men and women who defend our country. We're glad to work with you to help defend it. All right, last but not least, we've kind of hinted at this a couple of times, uh, but we are a, a small but growing company. We are hiring. So we are looking for a few different things. Uh, this job we posted a couple of months ago, and we're looking for an experienced software developer, hopefully with some Golang experience. Uh, we're also looking for an instructor. We're looking for maybe a couple of professional services folks, maybe even a salesperson, dare I say it. So if you know of anybody who might be interested in positions like that, come and talk to us afterward. Come and find us at B-Sides Augusta tomorrow. So if you're interested in more information about the software developer position, you can see Jason. Jason, wave your hand. You saw him on the developer panel earlier. Uh, if you're interested in the other positions, you could talk to me or Phil or uh, other folks on the team. So just reach out and let us know. Uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, building a great team. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that in the developer panel, we've built a great development team, we've built a great company, uh, and we're going to continue to build that so that we can deliver amazing solutions for you all. All right, so again, with apologies to Jimmy Fallon, thank you for coming to my sock talk. All right, any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? <laughs> well.
Well done, sir, well done. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right, well, I do want to say one last time, it's been real, it's been fun, it's been real fun. We appreciate y'all being here. Uh, we hope to see you at B-Sides Augusta tomorrow, and we hope to see you all again next year. Phil, anything else? All right. Thank you all very much.